Hello, welcome to episode 12 of Audio Visual Cultures, the podcast exploring sound and image cultures. I'm your host, Paula Blair. This edition is part one of a double recorded at the 2018 British Silent Film Festival Symposium on the 19th and 20th of April. Next week, Andrew Shale and I give an overview of the symposium and I talk to some of the speakers about their work. This week focuses more on the film festival and screenings. There isn't a full festival this year, but it is due to be held again in September 2019. There was, however, a day of screenings at the wonderful Phoenix Cinema in East Finchley. Later, we'll be talking to film historian Jerry Turvey about the history of the Phoenix, musician Stephen Horn about providing live accompaniments for silent film screenings, and it was such a real treat hearing and seeing him performing an improvised score for a film he hadn't seen. And I talked to Bryony Dixon from the British Film Institute about the festival, film restoration and duplication. Firstly though, I speak to early film historian and enthusiast Tony Fletcher, who programmed much of the day of screenings in the Phoenix on the 19th of April. The recordings were made in public, so please forgive the noise of London in the background. Here's me speaking with Tony. Tony, if you would like to introduce yourself... My name's Tony Fletcher. I'm an early film historian involved with the Cinema Museum at Kennington for the last 30 years. But I spend most of my time looking at early British silent film, but sometimes sound. And this morning at the British Silent Film Festival, you've shown us a really wonderful collection of phonofilms, is that right? Yes, and although it's a silent film festival, the films that I showed were made when silent films were still being shown on the screen. So this is what we call transition period in Britain between 1924 and 1929, when they were making, or De Forest was making, over a hundred short sound films at Clapham in 1925, 6 and 7. And then they moved to Wembley Studios, where the British Empire Exhibition used to be in 1928 and they actually continued and they made a feature called Dark Red Roses which survives in 1929 because they had a fire and then the company merged with a Triogon, a German group. Wembley Studios continued right the way through. I don't know it closed. It could still be open, I'm not sure. <laughs> we were chatting there and you you said many, many wonderful things that were fascinating. Because somebody like me, I work more in the contemporary period and I'm learning all the time more about the early era and the silent mm-hmm. era. So it was really fascinating to finally see some photo well, films. Well, well, most of the films that survived from this period, there are some documentary shorts, but most films are records of musical and variety yes, acts. Yeah. And many of the performers have been forgotten. Some of them are popular songs of the day. So some of them, I didn't show many today, one or two probably, but um, they would have been pushing music sheets by a man called Lawrence Wright, who composed as Horatio Nichols. He had two names. In fact, in Blackpool, they've got a big archive of his music sheets. And in 1926, 27 maybe before and afterwards, he used to have three summer shows. One in Blackpool, one in the Isle of Man, and one, I think, in Liverpool. And what they did were in 27, particularly 28, is they recorded a number of his artists, and we saw some of them today who would have appeared, like the jazz band at the end, the final oh, yeah. film. Though they were American, they actually appeared on the Isle of Man oh. in the summer of 1927. Uh-huh which is the reason why we have the film. Wow, and they're the Coney Island Six. Yes. A lot of, I'm pretty sure they're all American. They came over to Britain principally because they could drink alcohol over here, you see. Okay, oh yes, prohibition. Yeah, Yeah. prohibition, until the end of 29. The Labour government came in 29. Mm -hmm. They tightened up the rules on immigration and a lot of the American jazz players couldn't get a permit Mm -hmm. and had to return to America or went to Germany Mm -hmm. or France. Although prohibition was, by then, I think was a little bit laxer. Mm -hmm. So actually they could go back and have a drink in some places in the States. For me, that was the best film. Put it last night. It was, like, it was, it was great film. fun. Because yeah. you, because when you watch it at BFI on the Steam Deck, you're watching it at 24 frames per second. These films were shot at 21 frames per second, although the BFI was sort of at 22. So you can really only hear them at the right speed, mm-hmm. seeing the right speed, when they're shown in the cinema, mm-hmm. which is what we saw today. There were still a few quirky ones. The oldest 
film, I think, today was the one, the man, the clown with the dog. Dandy George and Rosie. And I could find no reference to that appearing in Britain in the years they made the phono films. Mm -hmm. And I think it may be made in the States. And there is an advert for a clown and his dog phono film Sorry. from 1925. Wow. So that could well be the earliest film on the program. Mm. And the sound quality was very good yeah. for that particular, on that one. particular one. It was fascinating to see the range because it wasn't just people talking to the camera or conversations or just doing musical numbers. There was a lot of dancing in there as well and the likes of the Klein acts and that kind of thing. So you could hear the tap dancing. Yeah, the period when the films were made would have been I think in two of the films you actually had the black bottom advertised, yeah. which would have just been introduced into Britain at that time. Mm. So there are actually several phono films which are dance instruction films where a dance instructor would show the audience how to dance on film. One survives, and we did show it once many years ago with Lawrence dancing with a woman called Jenny Hamilton. Oh. I don't know Jenny Hamilton. But they actually did try to do a dance to the Flat Charles, <laughs> it was called, to a tune written by Billy Mayo, who is very well known musician who did appear in at least one phono film with Gwen Farrar. If you've never seen the Gwen Farrar phono film, no. it's undoubtedly probably one of the best phono films, and certainly one of the best by a woman. What I haven't shown this conference is the more classical music. We did one at the Barbican some years ago where we showed the classical phono films. The problem with that is sometimes the high-pitched voice of a woman doesn't work because it sounds like a screech. Yeah. We did a bit of La Bohème, if you know La Bohème, oh, Genie, yeah. and there's some of that. I still don't know who was singing, <laughs> but they were obviously... Because in America, the phono films in America, America, although they made popular phone films, they also try to emulate the Vitaphone of doing a lot of classical repertoire. There was an attempt to copy that. Not that successful. I think, I think the more popular variety ones were more successful. They would have been shown mainly in small cinemas around the British Isles in 1920, end of 26, through 27 and 28 probably for a period of five or six months, from about April through to September. The programme would have just been about half an hour, 45 minutes. It would be added to the regular silent film programme okay. that was going on. A lot of them didn't work because the sound attachment that was given to the projectors, often the technicians didn't know how to work it and often the sound would be completely out of sync yeah. or wouldn't sound right and there were quite a few court cases against the Forest phono film by managers wanting to get their money back right. because they were so they considered a pup. In fact, if the film was shown by the company themselves, they were normally not a problem. But the problem is having other people knowing how to use their sound. What exactly would the system have consisted of? What would it involve? What equipment? Yes, well, you asked me a technical question, which I can't answer oh. you in the top of my head. <laughs> but worry, there, yeah. there would have been attachments to their normal projectors, so uh -huh. they wouldn't have actually hired a special projector. The reason is the take-up speed, because this is before sound film, so you're talking about putting an attachment onto a silent film uh -huh. projector, which they would have had to hire with the films. But I, it's a good question you've asked me, I must go and look it up. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know a lot more than I do mm. about it, certainly. So you were talking about Billy Merson yeah. earlier as well. I mean, this is somebody that certainly me and my generation aren't really aware of, but was very famous at the time. That was the first film you showed, you and I in my gondola, and it was a really very funny comedy song. Yeah, he specialised in parodies. He made 12 in 1926, the summer of 1926. During his day, he was very famous. He was top of the bill. Mm -hmm. Some of the other films you've seen would not have been top of the bill. He was very big name. As I said, he did also make some silent films in the teens. He made seven, three regular films, which is about 45 minutes to an hour, none of which survived. And he didn't just act in them, he produced them. It was his company. Uh, uh, and that's a, a sadness to know what... 
what he would have been like when he would have been in his mid 30s and you know and probably been to see how he would have made the silent film because we don't know at the same time Lupino Lane was making silent films he also made sound films as well but Merson was involved with Lupino Lane at that time some of the selections there's almost something grotesque about them I was finding when watching them because I don't know there's something sort of maybe it's just a cultural difference in terms of the time by grotesque um, what do you mean some of them are they're funny, but they're tipping over into being annoying. Well, quite a few today would be politically incorrect. Well, yeah, there's uh, that too. You know, yeah. um, and some of them are quite crude. Quite a few of the performers were pantomime yeah. performers when you do get crudity uh -huh. in that. And also the black bottom dance, mm. there was a reference in there which you wouldn't want no. to say today no, at all. Exactly. It could, I mean, there are worse examples which yeah, I wouldn't. For sure. I wouldn't in yeah. fact, there's one film that Brian, or two that Brian, he's banned me from showing. Okay, right. <laughs> well, there you go. It's fascinating how things have moved on, but also, I mean, I think it's still important in a way to revisit them and look at where we have come from and you know, not to go back there yeah. as well, in a way. Yeah. yeah, it says a lot about the time. And when you go back to Northern Ireland, is it? <laughs> Well, that's where I'm from, yes. You can do, yes, I, I you, you can do some search <laughs> me and find out which cinemas in Northern Ireland yeah. show because they did get shown in Ireland as well. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know. Where, only the local papers can tell that. In fact, do you know Jerry Turvey, who is involved with the cinema here? He wrote a book about the Phoenix oh, Cinema. Right. I'm He's here. He, he like told me that here. the phone films were shown here Don't in know. 1929 because when sound on the film came in, became popular, they reissued the phono films at 24 frames per second. Oh, right. So actually, some of those do survive. But they didn't show them here when they came out in 26, 26 probably because there's a music hall near here or a variety hall and they were not allowed to be shown anywhere near a music hall because it would put the performer out of business. The two things were not allowed to mix. So sometimes you'd find them in six. So if you went to, for example, Belfast, the chances are you won't find them being shown in Belfast. You'd probably have to go to a smaller town 10 miles from Belfast, okay. where there's no music hall or variety hall, and that's where right. they will be shown. That's fascinating. That's Amazing. often. Andrew's done some research in Newcastle, where we live, specifically on the Tyne Theatre, and it's past because it was the Stowe Picture Theatre at the mm. time, and it has shown many of these kinds of films. The phone films were actually shown in Newcastle, yeah. and the man called George Black hired them out in end of 26, early 27. I'm not sure how long for, and I haven't really researched Newcastle for these films, but there's definitely a reference to George Black, who became a big impresario yeah. of showing these films somewhere in Newcastle, probably from December 26 through to June 27. I'm not sure about after that. It may have been at the bigger music hall, possibly. He may have done a deal there. It may well be that some of these artists didn't go to Newcastle. There was that to be said, if an artist didn't travel to certain places and it wasn't part of the circuit, then you could show the films there. So if you were part of the Stoll Moss circuit and there's no Stoll Moss theatre in that town, you probably could show the phono film there. It depends on that, yeah. Did the phono film die off when sound proper came in then? Well, the phono film is sound proper and it started in the States first. Uh -huh. Lee De Forest invented it. One of his partners, the magnet Cyril Elwell, who was Australian, he basically ran the British concern for the first three, four years. And then when it flopped, because of problems with the sound being shown properly. A man called Isidore Schlesinger, who was an African, came in and took over the, the uh, phone. He changed the name to British Talking Pictures, oh. which you probably have heard of. Mm -hmm. So British Talking Pictures is actually the forest phone of him under a different name. And he moved from Clapham, which is where the film was shown, which, according to Vivian Van Damme, you probably know Round the Windmill. Vivian Van Damme was the manager of the Phono Film Marketing in 1925, 6 and 7, before he had to leave. He described his autobiography, the studios, in not very good terms. He called them like a lady's lavatory. Oh, right. Because that's probably what they were. Right. They used an underground lavatory system in Clapper, uh -huh. because that's where they developed the film. They had a lot of running water there. Right. So they could do it, actually, in situ. So you probably had, in the hall, the Clapper, the old grand hall, they probably would have had the studio in there, and then in the basement, they would have had the toilet facilities where they used to develop. 
films. And there's still a puzzle about how the film was developed because in 1929, sound and film was shot in separate cameras. Uh -huh. In 1925, six and seven and eight, the phono film was shot in the same camera. Yeah. So there's still a puzzle about how one developed. Could you develop the sound and picture using the same chemical solution? Because we know that when they're in different cameras, they use different solutions to develop them. We're not sure about that. Although the sound strip is different, it looks different in the forest system than in the later system. You have variable density, variable area, so they actually do look like two different physical components. Brilliant, that's really informative. Thanks so much. Right, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. And good luck with the rest of oh, your thank you. podcast. <laughs> Have a lovely time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks again to Tony for that. Next is Andrew Shale and I speaking with Jerry Turvey. Hello Jerry, it's lovely to meet you. If it's okay, can I get you to say your, your name and how you like to identify yourself? I'm Jerry Turvey. I suppose these days I call myself a film historian. Right. We're in the amazing Phoenix Cinema in East Finchley and I hear you've written a really thorough history of the building. Yes. Would you like to give us a bit of background about the building? OK, you stop me. <laughs> All right. The basic building was erected in 1910, the firm that was putting it up actually went bankrupt and consequently we didn't get opened until oh. May 1912. Yeah, they were planning a whole sort of chain of cinemas around London but they couldn't raise the capital for it and so they went bankrupt. What is interesting about the original building is that whilst this is the basic structure, the front of the building here was quite different originally. It was a kind of Moorish facade. Right. And if you walk <laughs> along the side of the building you'll notice that there's a very gentle slope from up there down to the highway. Yeah. Consequently the original cinema projection was at the far end right. and the screen end yeah. was here. Wonderful. Immediately underneath us would have been the cinema vestibule and the entrance and then behind that in the auditorium was a small stage and an orchestra pit. And obviously, you know, films were silent back then, but cinemas weren't. And so we had a small orchestra here in the 1920s because there was a cinema each of the Finchleys, because there are three Finchleys. Yes, they yes. tended to compete in terms of their orchestra. So when you look at the advertising, mm. then they're pressing, yeah, they're pushing the orchestra, particularly the leader who was oh, always okay. a violinist. We also, at this cinema, and not in the other competing local cinemas, have live acts. So not only were there the films, the orchestra would also play musical interludes, and then you'd also get a couple of live acts on the stage in the auditorium. Consequently, the sort of films that Tony showed this morning, we were the first local cinema to convert to sound. Okay. The major films, like it says on the advert on the side of the building here, was the Warner Brothers sound on disc nice. film. But the shorts accompanying it were the kind of things that were made in Britain that Tony showed us. And that of course displaced both the orchestra and it displaced the live entertainment, which I suspect must have really reduced the budget. Because if you think you're paying cinema staff, you're paying live performers, you're paying actors, that would have been a really sort of quite heavy cost for the cinema. Do you want me to keep going? Please, as much as you want to say. That's okay, amazing. well obviously the cinema is different from what it was then yes. and the, the key moment came in 1938. Mm -hmm. Cinemas like this were licensed in terms of safety. The Middlesex County Council was responsible for us. By then, by the late 30s, the cinema was really quite old. It wasn't up to current standards. Middlesex did a survey of all of their older cinemas and gave them a kind of deadline. You've either got to come up to modern standards or we won't issue a license. At the same time, of course, the 30s is the second wave of cinema building in this country with all of the big super cinemas and the area. Muswell Hill, the other things with, saw some of the most impressive 
of the compete the, the new super cinemas in modern design and so on. If you look at books on the history of cinemas, a whole lot of the local ones, the Muslim Odeon, the Gomont in North Finchley, they're star kind of cinemas. So we had two problems in one, the deadline that was given us by Middlesex County Council, and then all of these fancy new cinemas, which were stylish, elegant, modernist design. Consequently, the people that took the cinema over in 1938 totally transformed it. So projection changed ends, moved from the far end to here. The interior was refurbished so that the decor that you see there now it was what was put in place in 1938. Right, right. Those wall panels were done by a couple called Mollow and Egan, who were very important in interior design for cinemas. And a few years ago, I forget whether it's Mollow or Egan's daughter came here, but she'd never seen one of Dad's oh, cinemas, really? and she could actually oh, see, the, see, the, see the cinema. <laughs> she gave the impression that we're the only place that still has any of the Mollow and Egan oh, material gosh, on it's really there. special. And the other transformation, of course, was the frontage. And so we've now got that kind of marvellous rectangular frontage, the neon, yeah. you know, the, the, the vertical and the horizontal and so on, which in a way takes its cue, I think, from what the Odeon cinemas were doing. The Odeon cinemas were very fresh in that kind of modernist design. And so we adopted that approach. And consequently, the cinema took on a new lease of life. The 1940s, of course, was the peak of cinema going in this country and we had lots of buns on seats. <laughs> the emblem of the Phoenix is really distinctive. Is there a story behind that as well? Well, the cinemas had various <laughs> names so over the years. I can't, remember, I can't remember its original name, but we were the Coliseum in the 20s. Right, when right. we had the 1938 refurbishment, it was the Oh, well, they're all outside. Is that what's on the side That's of it, the wall? Yes. Okay. So was it the picture drum? The picture drum. Right. The second big crisis, 1938 was the first big crisis. The second big crisis was in the 80s. 1984 was the trough of cinema going in this country, so you know, tendencies are gradually falling away everywhere. Ironically, lots of those big super cinemas from the 30s, they were big cinemas, consequently they needed a large audience to fill them. They weren't getting the audiences, a lot of them closed down. There came a time when we were back to being kind of the only cinema in the area yeah. because the others had closed. Nevertheless, like everywhere else, we suffered a decline in audiences. Although I should have said before that that one of the things that kept us going with it at the start of the 70s is that we moved from being a kind of standard cinema to an art house cinema. Okay. Attendances had really dropped as a young guy that was a manager here was allowed to go his own way and he tried programming serious films and it picked up and so we were doing quite well. An organisation called Contemporary Films took us over. Contemporary Films were primarily film distributors but they wanted show houses for their films so they had us a cinema in Oxford and another cinema in central London. They were distributors of art house films and some of the programming had come from them. So they took this over and turned it into a really rigorously art house cinema with a whole lot of same new German cinemas, cinema films showing here. But nevertheless, they had to face the fact that audiences were falling off. The guy in charge of contemporary suggested that, well, maybe local people would be interested in forming a trust to take responsibility for the cinema. There's a likelihood that we would close. Barnett uh, local authorities were prepared to have an office block put on the site. A local campaign was generated to save the cinema. What was then the Greater London Council was interested. There was a kind of face-off between the GLC, which was a Labour council, and the local MP, was Margaret Thatcher, who was a Tory Prime Minister at the time. There was this kind of political aspect to it. But the upshot of it was that the GLC gave a local trust money to purchase the cinema, 
the trust became a charitable trust and from 1985 onwards the cinema clearly has operated commercially but it is actually being a charity and consequently it's not just been a cinema to show art house films but it's had an outreach into the local community it's taken its local community very seriously so it's hosted the Jewish Film Festival for example but it's also had a whole lot of educational projects with local schools and so on. Yes. So we weathered 1985 because we became uniquely a charitable trust. We had local government money to allow us to purchase a cinema. We survived and we're still here. Wonderful. That's a very brief, hasty history. Of oh, the that's really wonderful. Thank you. It was lovely to see the posters outside the, the Saturday Film Club for Kids. That's right, stuff, yes. Which is yes. really great. Oh, we actually have also something which I think is Eleanor when she was here pioneer the outside screen. Oh, wonderful. Uh, on, on a, I think, Thursday morning once a month, where they tend to show musicals because people with Alzheimer's can actually respond to that. So, and Eleanor, when she was Heritage Officer here after 2010, because we got money from Heritage Lottery Fund to refurbish the cinema. So the interior was done up and made to look as it did in 1938. So that's the 1938 look. Oh, that's fast, yeah. And the architect had the brilliant idea of turning this space here, which is offices, into the cafe because yeah. that gave us an extra revenue stream and he also had the bright idea of turning that balcony into which is getting some good use today yeah. <laughs> so how did you end up studying this cinema in particular because i live locally oh, okay. <laughs> and have you always lived locally since the early 70s oh, yeah. Wow. yeah so this was my cinema but then you know, because it became a charitable trust, then I became one of the board of directors and was on the board for 20 odd years. When we were putting in for Heritage Lottery funding, I retired, so I got time to just go off and research the cinema, so that's why I did it. <laughs> I, I hear from a lot of retired colleagues that retirement is a time when you actually get to do the work. It is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you end up being busier than that's you ever right. I mean, I've actually written a book on British and Colonial, though I've still got to find a point. <laughs> oh, oh well, <laughs> Great. This was a mythical book a good 15 years ago, I think, when you and I first met. Yes, so well, that, that, that was the intention. It, it, it actually exists as a tangible text. It, I mean, at the moment, Manchester are considering it. Whether they'll take it up or not remains to be seen. Oh, but, good luck. So, I've now moved on to Robert Hayden. British and Colonial needs a book written. It does. Yeah. Given that Simon Brown did his book on Hepworth. Yes. Yeah. British and Colonial was an underdog when it first emerges, but then quickly, and it's, what is it, 19 now? It started in 1908. Yeah. Issues his first films, yeah. and by 1911, 1912, it's one of the biggest players. It is, it is. It's, it's, it's one of the top three. I mean, I've got statistics to demonstrate. <laughs> I expect nothing less. I mean, by 1914, it's definitely one of the top three, and, and recognised as that within, obviously, the industry. Well, if it comes out any time soon, let me know. Yeah. I'll reference it to pieces. I do a little case study in the book which I've got coming out with Ivy Taurus soon of the uh, publicity campaign from Lieutenant Daring, oh, wow. which involved the public appearances, yeah. both by yeah. someone who does seem to have been personally yeah. by other people yeah. around the country. Well, I've um, got stuff like that in the book. But my best thing on BNC's publicity is for the Battle of Waterloo, because there's an awful lot of information about that. You know, it's a really big promotional I suppose BNC is a bit more of a palatable name than what it actually stands for, isn't it? Well, that's it? right. I mean, that's the title. <laughs> BNC, not yeah. British and Colonial. Oh. <laughs> British and Colonial Kinematical, I think it's the full title, isn't it? It is. I, I love it, actually, the British and Colonial Kinematical I've come from. <laughs> <laughs> So if anybody wants to find your book on the Phoenix, what's yes. the title of it? It's over there. It's actually, we've run out of copies. Oh, it's right. it, but it's available on Amazon uh -huh. for 99p oh, Kindle yeah. Low Day. Okay. So it is the Phoenix Cinema, a hundred years of film in each Finkley or something like that. I can't remember the cover title. Great. Basically the Phoenix Cinema. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you and so much. It seems we can pick up a copy for 15 quid today if we want. No, I don't think you can because we haven't got any. You can have it for 99p on Amazon Kindle. <laughs> we would expect nothing less. Well, that's it. I mean, when you run out of copies, we just put it on. I've got a point at that. My wife did that. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs>
Phoenix in Camden. Yeah. Well, you can identify the film, yeah, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That's amazing. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks again to Jerry. It was really informative and so great learning more about that beautiful cinema. Next, Andrea and I speak to musician Stephen Horn in quite a noisy pub. Well, Stephen Horn, thank you so much for speaking to us. So you've had quite an active afternoon yep. today doing what I gather was a totally unplanned yep. score for the Marquis of Bolivar. Bolivar, yeah. Yeah, and that's a 1928 film directed by Walter Summers. We've never seen it before and you produced this incredible score that we've been gushing about for the past. <laughs> okay, thank you. Glad to hear it. It really was blind and the sort of programme notes that I was given and the verbal notes that I was given were not completely helpful sometimes uh-huh. because I was advised there would be a big Spanish theme to it. Okay. But actually the Spaniards were very much in the background That's as it turned out. It's all about the occupying forces, not the occupied. I was all set to play the flamencos. And, you know, <laughs> anyway. You got the Marseillaise in there at one point. Yeah. Well it was sort of a oh, half alluded to but then I got confused because they kept coming out with German names. Mm. By the end I was confused as to whether they were French or German. Yeah. To be they were Hessian soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So yeah. this is a period in history where the French have taken over some of the German states. Mm. Germany doesn't exist yet. Yeah. They've taken over some of them and so pressed some of them into their own armies. Right. They haven't got as far as Prussia and that's where their yeah. territory kind of ends. Right. And the Prussians are the ones who then unify Germany later on and make everyone else into Germans. Right. And everyone else right. into Prussians and say, you were just Germans anyway. According to Bryony, this was all about English land pruning of German appetite. Okay. So the Germans who cost with their moustache twirling. But to us, it went right over our heads, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we're used to Germany rather than this federation of lots of different yeah. states. Vaguely Germanic names. I think I kind of half guessed that, that was the historical background, but I just sort of tried to play it a little bit neutrally, you know. Mm. A little bit of both, yeah. <laughs> Way back when you did a, an accompaniment to John Dartmoor mm-hmm. for a screening of it that I did at Oxford, yeah. you have already started doing that, reaching inside the piano and doing yeah. things other than playing yeah. the keys. Right, right. <laughs> can you tell us what you did today? Today? We can just about see what right. you're doing, but how do you get those sounds other than actually right. playing the piano? It depends partly on whether it's an upright or a grand piano as to what you can do. Today it was an upright, so I took off the front and the lid, which makes a much bigger sound, a uh, richer sound, which is always good in the cinema. Modern cinemas have very dead acoustics because they're designed for music coming out of PA, mm. not for live music in one corner of the room. They tend to be carpeted and you know, things on the walls. So to take off the front, it's a, kind of a bit of a body. And so, yeah, you just got the strings there. It's literally just doing effects on the mic, strumming from dramatic like, explosions and things. I had um, a strap vitamin, I was using this. Oh. I've got a saw folks, I've got a vitamin C <laughs> uh, tube, and I was doing that on the strings. Oh, wow. And the other thing I started to do is a melodic plucking of the strings which can create quite a nice effect because you work out where the string is now and then it moves in semitones but each string has each note has two strings if you want to play a melody you have to half guess it but you know if you're playing a chord and you have a plucked note that is actually in tune with the chord as opposed to just the sound effect that can be quite nice is this a signature Stephen Horn set or um, do others do it well I think every musician probably uses aleatoric effects as we call them but uh, I probably do it a bit more the other thing that I've been doing since Cottage and Darmour, but you probably haven't seen, is that I usually play other instruments. Because Cottage and Darmour was sort of, I've been doing purely solo piano accompaniments for about 15 years, and then that kind of Cottage and Darmour, I put, I put that, everything into that one score, and shortly after that I started playing the flute, and then the accordion, and some percussion instruments, and various things. But I tend to only do that if I know the film, because I then plan the moments. So is there something a lot more conducive to just making it up on the spot with a piano? Then? It's more that there's a physical, actually a manoeuvre that's required to put down one instrument and pick up another. Right. So if you don't know the film and you, you're playing, oh, that would be a good moment for the accordion by the time you... <laughs> The timing is out. Can you envision just having an accordion and not having a piano and doing sure. a couple of minutes? I wouldn't do that because I'm not a good enough accordion player. I use it for interludes. And stuff like that. I also do this thing of playing the two at the same time: piano accordion, piano flute, 
which I partly developed because of my limitations on those other instruments. But when I started doing it, it actually works nicely because it makes it sound a bit like an ensemble. Um, when I do those kind of accompaniments, I don't want to wrap them in any instruments, so I want there to be some point to it. To be honest, there were no obvious moments in that film today where I thought that had to be with a different instrument. In a way, they use the piano so much, there were quite ghostly parts. Yeah. And you utilise the chords really beautifully with that. And then the one that struck me was when you remembered the nine strokes of the bell right, at yeah. nine o'clock. That was really beautifully done, I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really a matter of just play by touch, basically. Uh -huh. So you just look at the screen and you just hang on its yeah. coattails. How long do you feel it's taken to get to that intuitive place with it? Well, I mean, I've been doing it for over 30 years. Yeah. I think I had an aptitude for it quite quickly because yeah. I think it's not... It's not, I'm not sure, convinced you can teach people how to do it. No, no. And I think it's a lot to do with how in tune you are with film. I suppose, you know, there are much better musicians than me who won't do song yeah. film accompaniment. I was going to ask about that as well, like the difference between being a musician and just playing music, but actually to play music for that purpose, to bring yeah. a film alive, and to be in tune not just with the rhythms of music, but with the rhythms of a film and a yeah. narrative. You are subservient to it, or at least you should be, unless you want to turn it into a different kind of You can turn it into a concert if you want to, <laughs> but then that should take place in a concert hall. Because uh -huh. it's not about you playing, it's about the film. So. Yeah, I, well I think so. It's improved over the years, okay. but I was a film lover before I started doing it. Right. So I was studying music, but at university I was going to the cinema about three times a week. And I had seen some films before I started playing for them. That side of the thing came quite quickly. The ability to read a film. I mean, second I'm guessing after doing a lot of films you can sort of, not every film is the same, but about 10 minutes in you usually get a sense for what the rhythm of the film will be. And that film did have certain, not repetitions exactly, but kind of realise, oh, there's a certain rhythm to when it will be dramatic and when it will be comic. Yeah. And these weird shifts in between comedy and drama. And it did set up things like the bells, because she did say, meet me at nine, and things like that. When you see an intertitle saying, meet me at nine, yeah. you kind of party goes, oh, okay, there might You're be... You're blanking that and yeah. saving it for later. <laughs> and it was brilliant the way you did the, when the guy's playing the organ, and the shot's going in and out. Well, I was trying to work that out, because if I'd had the accordion, I probably would have tried to play the accordion at that point, because the recording can sound a bit like a harmonium, but it probably wouldn't have been right because that was obviously such a big organ. But at first, when he started playing, I was saying, "Okay, he does, he's probably a good organ player, and he's playing Bach or something." But then by the end, he looked just like he was hammering it. Hammering it to make noise. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that slightly changed as I was doing that scene, just reading it in the moment. And what did you think of the film? I thought it was alright. Tend to be presented with these films with a kind of, okay, it's got its problems, but open minds, people. Yeah. But I actually, I loved it. I didn't think it had any significant problems. Right. I think it had direction, and it had those comedy relief moments that yeah. used the tension, and it had creative cinematography and lighting. Yeah. And there was no point where it actually got boring. Right. The one we watched this afternoon, there were points when I was going, I can see what's happening here, I can understand it's coherent, but the momentum is really lacking. Yeah, yeah. Whereas that was, we're going somewhere. Yeah, there was stuff happening. Yeah. I was glad I was playing for the one I was playing for, I have to say, because that one I thought, yeah, I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> God knows what I'd do for this. <laughs> Other than just play, you know, try and make a pleasant sound, sort of, yeah. to keep people sort of <laughs> awake. reasonably awake. Yeah. Yeah. That film seemed to have quite a divisive effect. So, you know, someone was saying, oh, one of the worst films I've ever seen. Oh, you know? wow. All right. Do you mean chips the past in the night? No, the one I played for. Oh, yeah. I quite enjoyed it. I think Bryony didn't really talk it up or anything. No, she was quite she really negative does. about it. And I thought, why are we going to watch this then if it's that bad? Yeah. <laughs> Quite fun, and I don't think it was as difficult to follow because it was set up. Well, my feeling was uh, I, I've seen some other films by that director, and uh, I think he's a very good director. Yeah. And they always have some flair yeah. visually, but I think he's probably only as good as his script. And I think probably it, it was not a great adaptation of a novel. That's what Brandy was saying as well. Compared to Ships That Pass in the Night, which was also an adaptation, I think. You need to know the original. There was kind of a dragon shift that passed in the night in that whenever someone said something, they'd start to speak yeah. and then it would cut to an intertitle of quite a long piece of dialogue. Yeah. And then it would cut back to them finishing saying that. Yeah. And we'd yeah. watch them say it for another ten I seconds. Know, you just read it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas 
Instant noodles can usually substitute for someone's yeah. speaking. Yeah. You've seen them start speaking. It's yeah. clear that they're speaking. This is what they're saying now. Yeah, yeah. we need to do some reading. And the time it takes you to read it, that's them saying it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a pattern in some silent films, it's true. I mean, it's yeah. always a bit of a plot. Also, intertitles are usually held on the screen longer than we now need to read them. Uh -huh. I think it was Kevin Brownlow said once that they were generally held long enough for you to read them twice, just to allow for the, I guess, probably the levels of literacy there. Would that really long two-page letter in ships that pass in the night, where each page is really long? Yeah. I found myself reading that so fast, yeah. anticipating that it would be disappearing well before I got to the end of each page. But then, of course, estimations had been made about how long it would take to read that much text. It's up there for a long time. Yeah, that was 50 feet of footage for that whole letter, I think. Yeah. A question is always in the back of my mind whenever I hear someone do a live mm. accompaniment. And we recently, um, I suppose recently, it was a couple last of years year. ago. Yeah. 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 2016. We saw yeah. Neil Brand. Yeah. yeah, we heard Neil Brand do his Buster Keaton thing. Oh yeah. Up in Newcastle. Right. The Friends of Eaton Park have a sonnet on night every uh, year, and it's usually has it ever been? It's usually Neil. Not there. No, no, we've played in Newcastle, but not there. So we make a point of going. You know, it's yeah. an annual opportunity to see a sonnet film without leaving Newcastle. I've always wondered: is it possible to do that as your full-time thing that you do, or is this what you do in addition to your full-time thing? I've been doing silent film full time for about the last four years, and I've been doing it for 30 years. Basically, it started off as a relatively occasional thing for me. The sort of bread and butter work I did for years and years was accompanying dance, playing ballet schools and companies, particularly one school for about 15 years, kind of like London's equivalent of the Fame Academy. So that was 80% in silent film and 20%, and gradually the silent film started to take off. But once I copied from Dartmoor, it took me to to international festivals. So once it started doing it, getting on the international circuit, then it got much busier. So yeah, about four years ago, it was getting a bit difficult to actually maintain the dance because I was always having to go away and find depths to cover me. So I just took the gamble. But it's not just playing, it's also a bit of composing and a bit of recording. At the moment, my living is sound film. What have you done recently apart from live accompaniments? Apart from live, uh, I recorded some music for a BFI animation package. That's going to tour, it's going to be offered to theatres. So that's a touring theatrical program. And I did four other similar things for the independent cinema office. I see a touring package. But it's mostly live? Mostly live, yeah. Probably 70% yeah. of what I do is live. Occasionally I get commissioned to write a score, which involves other musicians. There's a DVD I'm probably going to score sometime in the summer, and then there's another film that's been scored, which I'll be able to do a written score for, for like a quartet, but that may not be ready until next year. Is a quartet about as large a group of musicians as you score for, or have you gone even bigger than that? The most stuff scored for so far is a quintet. We've never done a chain walk or show, so that would definitely scare me. <laughs> I'd like to try it once in my life. And do you tend to create scores that are completely original or are there rearrangements of existing pieces of music? They're always original to me, but I do use other pieces of music. I'm always coming up with tunes and things like that, so and they're kind of logged in the bank, and then the composed score will often involve some bits and pieces that I've got in reserve. There's a certain amount of self-recycling that goes on, yeah. but I never play other people's music, unless it's specifically referenced in the film, which it does, you know, sometimes happens. One of the things that always strikes me about live piano accompaniments is that at those moments when someone's playing music in the story space, yeah. suddenly what you're playing turns from the non drive music into giant music. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're actually producing two levels of the soundtrack at the yeah. same time. So going, and when someone is firing a gun, for example, mm. you do also tend to do yeah. something because there's something yeah, yeah. at that moment so that you're almost providing Foley sound. Yeah, that as well, yeah, for sure. When I play for a film that I've seen before and there's an on-screen piano being played, then that's something I'll usually go to a different instrument. Oh, okay. So if I know in advance that that's going to crop up, I'll maybe play the flute or the accordion in the minute leading up to that, so that when the on-screen piano is played, then I go back to the piano. So oh, wow. have a trigger effect. That's brilliant. But that piano scene uh, was a bit of a nightmare because, um, first of all, completely without warning, you get close up with the strings, and I knew it was the heroine playing them, so I guessed that it was maybe romantic, they were playing romantic, and then it cut to her in close-up and she looked like she was playing something very upbeat. Oh. 
and so I sort of segued into that and then it became romantic again and it looked almost like a part. So I did three different styles within one scene. If I'd seen the film before, I would have gone for something that would have covered every, the whole scene. So Philistines like us, we didn't know this edit just right to us. Well, what I do when I, you know, playing it this way is I'm just basically hanging on the film's coattails. What I am doing is looking at the film and following the visual rhythm, so that's probably why it seems right, because I'm more or less matching the rhythm. It's a huge amount of concentration. It is, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just putting that out there that I really admire that. Thank you. <laughs> Whenever people ask academics about what they do all day, the answer is often, well, I teach for this concentrated period of time, yeah. and then because that's exhausting, I take some time out to do something that isn't exhausting. The description I always give is that it's like you're playing a puppet, but the puppet is also conscious. So at any one moment, you can let the puppet do its own thing, or you can control the puppet. And that's what it's like managing a discussion. So it's having to make a decision about once every second. Yeah. Doing that for two hours is exhausting. Yeah. So I, I imagine that it's actually even more intense for you're constantly having to make well. those decisions. Yeah. Even if it's a habit. Yeah, I guess. I, mean, I suppose I don't feel tired after a film usually. There's usually a certain amount of adrenaline going, but I can't even like almost fall asleep. If I sit down in front of the TV, you know, I feel like an old man now, you know. <laughs> the moment till everything stops and I can't concentrate on something else sometimes, like something goes fatigue, something hits. Do you have a record of the longest film that you've played? It depends. There's like the longest continuous playing and for the longest with breaks. Or both? The longest continuous without an interval. Certainly over three hours. Right. Probably around three and a half hours. That's the longest I've played continuously. And what film was that? Well, I'm trying to think. I played for a film of the 1926 Olympics, I think. Right. Right. Over three hours. Jack Hughes, Apple Dance film. Oh, wow. About three hours. I've done that a few times. It's about three hours. Fitz Lang, Spies. But then, usually, it's longer than So I've also done four films in a day. So that would be like seven or eight hours. Maybe, but with breaks, which will make a big difference. Or like uh, Dr. Mabusa, the gambler, oh, which wow, is in yeah. two parts. Together, I think they amount to five hours, but with a half hour break. You know, so. After that much playing, I would be quite happy to receive <laughs> quite a big check. The checks are never that big, not in silent films, uh, but it is proportionate to a certain extent. The problem is, particularly if it's not with that amount of playing, at a certain point you do just run out of ideas. It's hard to keep the momentum going. In that respect, other instruments is useful because sometimes I just on the piano at a time. <laughs> can't think what to play. Do you have any particular favourite films? Do you have favourite genres or favourite directors or anything like that? Yeah. In sound of film, no, I, people say that I, my favourite film to play for is a good film. Because like maybe a really well edited film? Yeah, the better the film, the more rewarding okay. it is. Even though actually, arguably, it takes more skill to play for a bad film or a film that has problems. I think music can help a film that has problems. You can help sell it to the audience, which I guess is what I was trying to do today. <laughs> Maybe this is why we were gushing so much yeah. about the film as long as you're playing. Yeah, well, that's it. Probably if we'd seen it without a score, we would have. <laughs> well, there always was without the music, you know. You need some music, yeah. otherwise it's really a tough slot. I mean, Cottage on Dark was still one of my all-time favorite ones. I think it's so endlessly uh, fascinating. It's one of those films which, it's about 90 minutes, but it seems like it's about 15 minutes long, right. because it has such drive. Um, Have you ever been taken outside of the UK to do a live accompaniment, or has it all been... Oh, all the time, the yeah. How far have you been? Asia. No, I average a non-UK gig about once a month. No. That's the only reason I can do it as a full-time job. I couldn't do it just on the UK one. Last week I was in New York. I came back from New York on Monday, arrived about midnight, and then Tuesday I went to Birmingham. I got back about 2 a.m. And yesterday or today I'm doing this. Tomorrow I go to Birmingham, Sunday I go to Bristol. But at the end of May I'm going to Korea, and then from Korea to San Francisco, San Francisco back to London. So are you going to cross the international date point? Yeah. 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 You're going to become a, year, a, a day younger than the rest of us. I think you, <laughs> you know, lose a day, don't you? From you're a day older than the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. San Francisco to the UK, you lose a day like 
yeah. time to travel. So you arrive a day later than you set off. Paul and I have been talking about travelling to New York for ages. To have someone just go, come to New York, we'll pay your <laughs> expenses for you. It's a nice way to travel, yeah. yeah. Sort of go somewhere you would probably like to go as a tourist and to come back with more money than you left. <laughs> do you ever get time to see these cities or is it always fly in, do the performance flyer? Sometimes, but generally there's no money in Salem so I get a fee plus expenses, so I'll get travel and accommodation plus a fee, but they'll only cover the accommodation for the amount of time that they need me there to do the job. But sometimes the job is maybe one film a day. In February I was at the Berlin Film Festival for eight days. I did ten screenings, but two of those days were free because I did other two or four days I did two films in one day. But you know, one two hour film, the rest of the day is free. So yeah, absolutely. Right. It's the thing which it tends to eat into conference attendance. You go, oh, I'm going to go to this city for three days and attend this conference. And then by about midway through the second day, you're starting to skive off panels to go and actually see the city that the conference is in because you've planned yeah. no free time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes if it's a place I really want to see as a tourist, usually the flight will be the same. You add on a few days, I may, on my own dime, shell out for a couple of days, pre or post the job, just to be a tourist. Have you ever done gigs where it's not a company film, where you do a talk, for example? I have done presentations, but always about the same music. So I've been on panels, I've done a couple of one man presentations, definitely not my comfort zone. I'm better like this, if someone asks me questions, then I respond, that's why. I'm taking part in sort of symposium type events, and there'll be a panel on music. But if the BBC came to you and said, do this six part series on the sign conference, do you game? Well, if I did, I'd have to go for it, yeah. But I'd probably have a nervous breakdown. I can't see anyone knocking at the door, but yeah, no, if that happened, obviously I'd have to give it a try. I've certainly got plenty to say about it. You have an insight into the rhythm of it, which yeah. the rest of us tend no, we to be relatively blind to. And I hadn't thought about rhythm until you said today that some of those shots were just way too long. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the yeah. emotional reaction shots were much too long. The various things that make contemporary audiences struggle with mm. silent film, and I would say if there's one thing above all, it's not black and white entitled, it's the pace, because we're now used to, I think, you know, far too much films just have to be attention deficit to start. Yeah the post MTV generation. And I think it's good sometimes to sit down and watch the film that the film is due to. I mean, Cotton Darmo is a classic, classic example. There's some shots you probably don't realise, but you know, if you actually analyse it, or you have watch it without music, uh, there are some close-ups on faces that just linger for a long time. But it's more noticeable in some films than others. That is one of the big things that music can help with. You can't fight against the rhythm of the film, because if you're trying to do too much, and the film is lingering, if your music is saying, I want this to move on, and it's not, you know, so you have to go with the film, but you can fill it up with music that hopefully has enough drama to play against that frustration that people might have. I do wonder why it's usually reactions to intense situations in the story space, where the characters are going, wow, that really intense thing's happening. Yeah. Why is it that that tends to get held for a really long time? And maybe it's something to do with directors going, well, on the stage, People would react, and we might be able to hold it for a couple of seconds, but the next piece of line, dialogue has to be delivered. So it would just be weird if everyone was really slowly reacting to something for about 15 seconds. But in film, there seems to be more license to... Well, no, maybe it's that in film they're going, we're going to try and mark the film out as speaking a different language from the stage. Yeah. So maybe in films, the magical universe where all films take place would be one in which people can just pause and react to something yeah. for yeah. an absurdly long amount of time. I think that box means that the outside world isn't waiting for you to... Yes. Have, what? what? Why are you zoned out? You know, it's that, mm -hmm. that you can, you're in this kind of like, little fantastical zone where you can, for about 10 seconds, just go, that's really, really troubling me, that thing that I've just seen. Yeah. Or maybe it's a kind of poor person's slow motion. Right. Maybe they're going, well, we can't actually do slow motion and have someone turn a one-second reaction into a 10-second reaction, but we can just have people move very slowly and yeah. it can look a little bit like they film as slow as time down. Right. But this is a question which is open. It's yeah. unclear what's going on there. Well, I think part of it is just historical. You know, the film did move at a slower pace, generally. Not always, there are some films that are incredibly fast, but uh, as a general rule, they move at a slower pace than we're used to now. And the other thing is, the acting style is a form of mime, and they're playing information without audible dialogue. That's part of the style of acting is a mime-based style. If people think they're going to have problems because they have a perception of style of film acting as being very over-the-top, that's right. I tend to tend to say, uh, 
try and think of it as opera. It's an operatic sort of right. form of cinema. The one time I've seen something in contemporary performance, which is a bit like silent cinema acting with that kind of constant intensity, is I saw a play in India, and it was a three-performer, one-act play that took well over an hour and a half. It was done in an ancient form of what we would probably call mime. Right. No character says in effect. They're all wearing very intense costumes, and everything they do is through very precise gestures. So it's virtually like they're speaking sign language. And we were given a little, the audience of completely non-Indian guests were given a little preview beforehand about what it is that people are actually saying with all these gestures. And one of the things that one of the characters was saying at one point was, "I love you like a hummingbird sucking nectar from a flower." Right. And so, "I love you like a hummingbird." Nectar from a flower. You can do that in five seconds, right? But of course, this was done with gesture and with musical accompaniment. And the hummingbird sucking nectar from a flower, it took two minutes wow. because the guy was miming a hummingbird sucking nectar from a flower. Right. And so five seconds was well over something like three minutes to say that entire statement. Wow. And I suppose that's something you can do in mime, isn't it? Is it yeah. if, if what you're saying is you're cramming, you're stretching dialogue, I suppose, out into emotive gesture. And that can last for as long as it takes to emote yeah. that idea properly. I suppose it's something like that. The point of it is not purely conveying the text or the meaning. It's conveying the meaning, but it's probably something that is considered poetic or musical on its own terms. And, and, you know, like music, you don't necessarily need it to move quickly. If you find it a lyrical form of expression on its own terms, then the meaning it's conveying is only one part of it, I guess. So we're seeing something which is, as far as the people who made it is concerned, it's a form of visual music. But we're expecting it Imagine, to be yeah. narrative action with a place to go. Yeah, I don't know, but my guess if you spoke to them would say narrative is only one relatively small part of it. Do you have a website or anything yeah. where people can get more information? Yeah, uh, it's basically my name, stephenhorn.co.uk, Stephen with a PH, Horn with an E. Okay. <laughs> and you're busy for the rest of the time, I suppose? Well, it fluctuates, it's typical freelance stuff. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, like anyone who does freelance work, peaceful family. Okay. Know, out or flood, <laughs> hence flying back from New York and then going straight to Birmingham. But I may have a week and I hardly do anything, but then theoretically that's when I practice and compose and stuff like that. In general, pretty busy. And what's your... Uh... Well, I'm a scholar of film and visual culture. I mostly yeah. work in the contemporary period. Yeah. But I've started this podcast and I'm trying to start a website that should go with it called Audio Visual Cultures because I want to, I think, give a platform to, I suppose, understudied and underprivileged areas of those kinds of cultures and in a very broad sense yeah. as well. I'm very interested in where film and cinema converge with other media because I don't think it's terribly clear cut, actually, no. but we box everything. I like to try and open it out a little bit. Yeah. So it's a kind of broader educational project that I'm trying to get off the ground at the moment. Right, right. So a lot of my own research is sort of video installation and contemporary cinema that's conflict based or conflict right. themed in some way. Which is what is conflict Yeah, happening. or post-conflict society. So this is a nice area where I can just sit back and give voice to other things really right. because you know we're not all just interested in one thing. And, no, no, sure. Yeah. Is this the first time of seeing a silent film for you? Or? No, I love silent film. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. You know, I've seen live scores before and I'm really keen to learn more. Mm. You know, I don't I feel like I don't know enough. I've been thinking more and more about film sound and film music mm. quite a lot lately because I'm more a visual person right, yeah. but I think sound in general in film doesn't get as much attention and it's not taken as seriously as yeah. other elements and so I'm just trying to sure. dig into that a bit more. Yeah one you know obviously for sound cinema music is I don't think you necessarily it's 50% of it but uh, yeah. it's a huge element Absolutely. compared to contemporary film and I think music in contemporary film can be huge. The music is the voice of the film if you like. Yeah. It's the original live cinema, really. Because now you have things like secret cinema and all these sort of immersive, yeah, interactive yeah. things. Which obviously, silent film isn't interactive in that sense, but it did always have this live element, yeah. which made the screening unique. That's it, because it's a different performance every time. So you could have the same film, but if there's different music to it, it's an yeah. entirely different film. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, there are composed scores, which 
four five you'll probably have a largely similar experience when it's played low for no but an improvised or semi-improvised score will always be different and obviously you can have the same film accompanied by different musicians it's quite nice now it's quite in vogue now to have silent film dvds where you have two or three optional scores which is i think a great thing i've seen that a lot with avant-garde films where yeah. there's maybe an electronic score or a more yeah. classical score to choose from where you can just watch it silent and it's a different film every time you see it yeah yeah there's a dvd label i think munich film museum edition film museum and they will always have a silent track actually okay. create a silent track yeah. which i don't like because yeah. i like to have music but yeah. there are people who maybe it gives you the freedom then to choose your own music you know you could put pick your favorite band or That's your favorite probably, album yeah. on it yeah also you can always move mute the film some people like to do that be their own dj my high scoring film on humiliation is that <laughs> i've never seen the giorgio moroder version of because that came out when I was a kid and everyone was all over it and they were like, wow, this is amazing, an electronic score to a silent film, but no, never seen it. It's like not having read Hamlet. Well, it's pretty horrendous to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Serious humiliation score on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, never watched it all the way through with that score. Just a night. The singing and the synth sound is it's very dated synth sound now. I've listened to the original score for Man with a Movie Camera and the um, Michael Nyman one. Oh yeah. It's full of very honky horns. I'm sorry to say I prefer the original. Right. Because yeah. it's just it sounds like a bit of a mess, the Michael Nyman one. The original one has isn't it great that City's doing its thing yeah. and everything's working together, it's yeah. it's quite positive and forward moving, whereas the Michael Nyman one's quite chaotic. Yeah. And I think the problem with Silent films that have a commission score from a non specialist. Yeah. Someone who sounds awfully pretentious, but someone who literally does not specialise in silent film scoring, they will generally do what they do. So I think you've got in mind Michael Nyman score first and foremost, and a Michael Nyman score for the film in second place. It tends to be what happens. Didn't the Pet Shop Boys do one for Battleship Potemkin yeah. a few years yeah. back? Yeah. It'd, be good to, it'd be interesting to do comparisons between those two. I haven't heard that, yeah. yeah. Some people like it, so maybe it's good. Well, I will release you, because <laughs> I'm okay. sure you want to go and chill out. Thank you so much, it's Thank been you. such a pleasure, and it was such a real pleasure to hear you play this afternoon. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very My much. Pleasure. It was really great of Stephen to give us so much of his time, particularly as he wasn't feeling particularly well and had just done this two-hour improvised performance. So many, many thanks to him again. Next is a recording I made the next day, so the background is a bit quieter. It was recorded at King's College London and it was a great pleasure to speak with Bryony Dixon from the BFI. Audiovisual cultures. So what I'm trying to do with it is explore sound and image cultures in the broadest way possible and collect up things relating in any way to what that could be. I'm trying to be quite borderless and loose about it yeah. and break that academic boxing of things. I'm also trying to privilege things that are understudied and yeah. not really given enough attention because I'm very interested in where things converge and where there's messiness and where things aren't able to be defined very clearly. What are the things that are converging? Is it broadly based on format of things? So are you looking for crossovers with formats or with content or all of those things? All of those things, yeah. Okay. My PhD research was about film and visual culture in contemporary Northern Ireland. Yeah. What I was trying to look for, certainly in post-conflict society, I was finding more useful stuff, more indicative stuff in the art galleries and experimental work that was happening rather than conventional filmmaking. Mm. So I started to broaden what you even think of as film. And then, yeah. you know, with digital coming in, I suppose that broadened me out, yeah. actually. I mean, that's the principal reason right there my film doesn't uh -huh. often get included in on all these sort of studies and debates is because it was very hard to see yeah. until really quite recently. Certainly in the course of my career at the BFI, it's changed utterly. It's amazing because you used to have to book to come and sit in the basement yeah. of the BFI and look at film on a kind of reel-to-reel -reel uh -huh. player. Uh, it cost money, which meant that that ruled it completely out for a lot mm. of people, or a lot of people would just be very scared of it. Yeah, it was a right old turn-off, really. Yeah. And, of course, that only meant the only access you had to stuff was only stuff that had already been duplicated mm -hmm. by the archive 
and for which there was a viewing copy. So that cuts the collection in half immediately. Mm. So, and you know, other stuff you would not stand a chance of seeing. So there's a couple of good examples. Wonderful yeah. London and the Haunted House films, yes. of which I think only one or two survive. Mm. But if I'd gone to ask my bosses to allow me the resources to get those copied, they would have gone mm. like, no because it costs a ludicrous amount of money for these things to be duplicated. And there's still an awful lot yeah. in the archive that's not copied mm-hmm. up. But we did get this big grant recently to do 10,000 films. Wow. So we were able to do a lot under mm-hmm. that, basically, all of those curiosities. Yeah. Because I knew I could play that off with the press guys mm-hmm. and go, look, Haunted Castles of Britain, it's on TV now. Yes, absolutely. And this you is know? something that's always been... Ghost been Stories first, is yeah. on TV now. The work of the whatever it is. It's not English new. Heritage. Mm-hmm. It's, no, it just cycles around. Yeah. Streets of London. Yeah. It's like perpetual. So it's really fantastic then to see, you've just said there, young academics coming through who would never have been able to see these films then, but also the general public, because it yeah. means that if they're online for free, yeah. any of us can see these now yeah. and realise well it's not all about the here and now mm. it's actually the here and now is a hundred years ago as well yeah. you know it makes it very contemporary for us Absolutely. and you can see very clearly that well actually things haven't changed that much no they know? really haven't and mm. um, yeah people do yeah there's a sort of cycle mm-hmm. I guess from now on people will be able to see clearer into the past so they might not yeah. constantly copy things and there will be a desire for real genuine mm. novelty but uh, good luck bringing that off but um, <laughs> yeah it's interesting there are still problems though I okay. mean apart from the massive expense of getting mm-hmm. stuff duplicated which can cost thousands even for a tiny thing like mm-hmm. that the other problems are we can only offer those in the UK for rights reasons so there are still mm. copyright issues with that material and this is a real problem that dogs the expansion of access to film in particular is Mm -hmm. copyright issues whereas I think they're slightly clearer for the written word photography can be problematic as well the copyright laws are very strange uh, pertaining to film they've Mm -hmm. always been very uneven it's a bit of a nightmare so we've had to go and clear all of the films on BFI player we don't have a kind of automatic you would imagine that an institution like the BFI would get some kind of government exemption Mm. but not at all in fact we are more duty bound to clear copyright Mm. so yeah it's good to hear that actually because the general public a lot of us would complain and go oh why doesn't such and such organization just do that you know and obviously there's these restrictions that we're just not aware of you know if you ever find yourself asking Mm -hmm. why don't there's a reason there will be a reason (laughs) yeah because obviously of course course we would put them on youtube if we could could, yeah and of course we would um make them available outside Britain Mm because of course the other great thing about film as an object of study Mm -hmm. is that it's a very international business always has been in fact probably more so when it was invented than Mm -hmm. now and in the silent days when there wasn't the language barrier Mm because you know you sent one of these films abroad and just cut out the titles and put your own in so it was very international and so we would like to study it internationally but we can't because Mm -hmm. of these stupid copyright rules and Mm -hmm. you know as if anyone cares all these years later yeah that's a bit of a bore to deal with Mm -hmm. in a way that you don't have with other things Mm -hmm. it's funny how film isn't mentioned with, um, I was watching um, Civilizations TV um, thing, which is an update of the classic TV series Civilization. Right, right. And you know, they're talking all the time about art, they talk about photography, oh my god, mm-hmm. they actually mention, mention photography, mm-hmm. architecture, da, 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 sculpture, blah, blah, blah. never mentioned film, mm. ever. It's still the poor cousin in many ways, mm. I would say. Mm. Even in academia, I've always felt that. Yeah. Having to justify your existence all the time. Yeah. Oh, you just watch films all day, that's all you do, yeah. you know, as somebody who analyses Because film. it's just entertainment. Yeah, sure, yeah. that's just watching movies. What's yeah. that? So hard life for you. Well, I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> yeah. all of the things we've been talking about today are great artistic works, but they're not. Yeah, yeah. Most of them were just average commercial product. Yeah. And the equivalent of uh-huh. quite they trivial stuff today. Yeah. However, they acquire 
more interest as they get older, of course yeah. they do. They've looking at London in the nineteen twenties mm. becomes interesting, much more interesting than it was in nineteen twenty four. But it's not the greatest film in the world, I think we all know that. But it has now acquired a genuine interest to look what's there and what isn't and how people perceived the value of buildings for example that's carried on nobody who's knocked down to pools and although they're trying to surround it with bloody towers mm. but no one has knocked down staples in or whatever you know these things are still there in fact almost exactly if you went around london today looking at the remnants of really old stuff it would look exactly like mm. wonderful London. Mm -hmm. It's become important, which is the thing of why you should keep everything. Yes. Not just the things that you think are important in your mm. own generation, because you can go very wrong that mm -hmm. way. And many people have. Yes, of yeah, course. Indeed. Got rid of stuff that we would give our items to see now. That's it. So it's really important that the BFI has these collections. When you duplicate, is it on film? Is it all digital now? Is it a mixture? Of... Yeah, we're still at the stage where we, and actually, uh, very luxurious moment for us that we can do both, which is great. There are certain things for which film is still better. We still like to do some film exhibition on film yeah. so that people get and understand what that experience mm -hmm. was. So we're building up collections of prints now that will be exhibited on film mm -hmm. so that people can see what that looks like in the future. In terms of preservation of certain jobs you do, for which film is indispensable. So you see all those intertitles. Quite often those get damaged mm -hmm. in old films or okay. they're missing or you've only got one frame because it's been sent from a foreign country mm -hmm. and they don't print up the whole title. Mm -hmm. They just send it with one frame and it's up to the printer to print it up in full. This happens a lot. So we need to make titles. Now mm -hmm. this is the one thing you can't do mm -hmm. digitally at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody will invent a way. But if you make a frame, photograph mm -hmm. it and then repeat it, it doesn't move. Okay. It's quite static. So you're going along with the film, da 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 da, a sort of sense of movement, and then, you know, <laughs> it freezes. Yeah. And it's a horrible shot. So, what we do actually is to make up the card in Photoshop mm -hmm. using an old appropriate alphabet, which oh, we make nice. up with the individual letters, put it all together how we think it should look, mm -hmm. or just photograph a frame, and then we film it. So, you film a piece of digital something. Uh -huh. oh. Going the other way then. And then yeah. print and keep doing that until uh -huh. it's got enough what we call film look, which is a bit of wobble and a bit of up and down, That's a bit of side flicker. to side, and a little bit of, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, texture. But without, because if you did that digitally, you've seen fake oh, yeah. stuff where they put in Almost scratches clearly. and stuff like uh -huh. we would put in scratches <laughs> where we don't want, I mean, very peculiar things to do, but anyway. <laughs> Sure, it's restoration rather than conservation or mm. preservation, but it's a nice, it's just one of those things mm -hmm. that you like to do. And ditto the long term preservation of a film, film is still better. Absolutely. You can stick it in the vault at Gaydon, which is where our big new lovely master mm. vault is, the big fridge. <laughs> You can stick it in there for hundreds of years and it will be fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas the digital codec and software and what have you mm -hmm. from whatever you're using today, super duper and modern as it looks, has a shelf life of about 18 months. It keeps moving so fast. Yeah. So it does. And it's also quite a lot of the time it's proprietary, mm -hmm. it's owned by a company and you're using it under license. Okay. Suppose that company goes, suppose it's taken over by another mm -hmm. company. These things happen. And will happen. Right. Will Microsoft uh -huh. be around in five years, ten years, mm. fifteen years? Who knows? Mm. We don't know. Maybe that's part of why retro fads, you know, you might look down on them, but actually it's really important to preserve all that stuff because the vinyl film that will outlive. I have VHS tapes that work better than a load of DVDs that I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love yeah. it. I love the... They won't forever, though. They won't forever, no. But there's still something about the tactile nature of holding the object. I agree. You know? And also, um, with VHS, I love the linear nature of it. Yeah. You know what you're doing with that. Mm -hmm. There's a beginning, an end, and a middle. And yeah. um, rather than popping about like you do on a DVD, uh -huh. which then goes wrong. That's our next job, as it happens. Really? Yeah, we've got a big 
grant from HLF to do videotape collection. Right. So next time I talk to you, we can talk all about tape format. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're the only person who thinks so. I, I love it. So. Yeah, oh, good for I you. I really love it. Good for you. Mm -hmm. I quite find videotape a bit sexy actually, but not a lot of people do. Mm. When you compare it to early films, whichever we sort of mm. get, it's all terribly glamorous and associations with Hollywood and what have you. Yeah, but there's nothing like film seeing a 35mm projection is, oh, yeah. gives no, me it's special. chills. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Brownie, if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about your involvement with the British Silent Film Festival yeah. and the symposium, if that's Surely. okay. So, the story all begins <laughs> in Italy, oh, 20 odd years ago, mm -hmm. and myself, Lorraine Porter, I think Neil Brand, and probably a few other people who are, may well be here today, mm -hmm. were sitting and talking, we were having a bit of a complaint, because there had been a series of British pictures on, I believe, Morris Elvey, oh, there may have been, or something, anyway, we were watching something we'd seen it before so we decided to get up and at the same time we noticed quite a lot of american academics getting up and saying oh we might as well go it's a british picture oh yes all right. how nasty was mm. that anyway so we were having a bit of a grumble about that mm. and then we thought you know actually why is it that british silent film has this terrible terrible reputation mm. And because I was working at the archive at the time, I said, well, you know, the thing is, I know, because I work booking films to people and doing viewing in the aforesaid basement, I know that almost no one has seen these things. Mm -hmm. I could name, personally, all the people who've ever watched right. these films. Mm -hmm. Why don't we put together an event and watch them? So we had Lorraine, who had a cinema at the time in Nottingham, mm -hmm. me working in the film archive at the BFI, Neil, who can play the piano, and we thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a gang here. We've got a gang, yeah. <laughs> so we can put the show on right here. So that's what we did. The British Silent Film Festival was born, and we ran it in Nottingham for many years until Lorraine moved on from there, and then it toured around a bit. And now we're doing it every couple of years, mm -hmm. wherever we can find somebody who will have us. But essentially, we have almost done the job we set out to do, which was to view the whole of British silent cinema. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of course, has gone online since then. We've almost done the job we set out to do, but now we're kind of expanding out. So we do British, British-related, mm -hmm. or we put British, some British film at the heart of a event and then okay. build some other films from other places around it mm -hmm. so that we've got more to play with. And the conclusions are... It's much more interesting than you think. It's true that there is no great movement like German Expressionism or anything like that where you can sort of look at a body of work and go, that's that kind of thing. Yes, it's absolutely true that the British never invested in mm -hmm. cinema so that it has a lower production value than most mm. French film, German film or American film, that's absolutely true. Not always true, there are some exceptions. Okay. Did it throw up some great auteurs? Yes, it did. Mm. Alfred Hitchcock, Asquith, there are some. And it has an awful lot of interesting stuff that people don't know about and they yeah. should. Having done the basic job of watching it for 20 years, it's time to spread it about. So yeah. we've done a bit of that. Now I'm a curator with a brief or silent film. I've been through putting projects, so things like Wonderful London, which we've seen today, yeah. which we did on DVD, and now on Player. We restored all of the silent Hitchcocks, the Asquiths. Okay. Some of those have been done on DVD and Blu-ray, where we've been able to get the rights. Things like Shiraz, the Indian film we did. It, which was really useful because we were able to send that to India with the British Council. It's a big thing. Fantastic, yeah. Um, because yeah. they don't have many of their silent films, mm -hmm. so to have something shot in India that early was a bit amazing for them. So British silent film is reaching the further corners of the earth, which is nice. You know, I don't think it's going to overtake Hollywood or German Expressionism or the great French films of the silent era. We didn't make a Napoleon. We didn't, it's true. However, this is something to do with the British not investing in the film mm -hmm. industry. We still don't. Yes, that's it. And yeah. there are all sorts of very, very complicated issues to unpack 
about that, which we should do one of these days, and really yeah. look into the class issue around film, which yeah. I think may be the secret to why. Mm -hmm. I think also the Brits and their money, they didn't need to invest in risky ventures like the Americans did, and they didn't need to bind their people together through film mm -hmm. in the way that the Americans yeah. did. I think in many ways film was what was depicting the people binding together anyway. I'm thinking of Humphrey Jennings and his war documentaries and then depicting the breakdown of that in the Lindsay Anderson films a bit later on and the British New Wave, which is fairly loose, I suppose, as a new wave, but a new wave nonetheless. Absolutely, it? it's just that yeah. we don't give a name to things. It's the yeah. other great thing that we don't do. The French always give the movement, yeah. however small, a name. Yeah. In fact, they even do that to us sometimes. It's very yeah. interesting that it's very difficult for us outside the academic community to mm -hmm. get Humphrey Jennings more seen by Yeah. And it was only when the French really championed Humphrey Jennings that all of a sudden everybody became interested. Yeah. The French say it's good, it must be good. <laughs> yeah. They're great filmmakers, they know what they're talking about. Absolutely. If it's any interest to you, I wrote part of my master's dissertation on Humphrey Jennings' films. Oh, great. I loved them. And I think it's a real tribute to him that when it came time for the mm -hmm. you know, opening ceremony of the Olympics oh, that they yeah. chose to sort of incorporate Jennings into that mm -hmm. national discussion which I thought was fascinating. The book that that was based on, Pandemonium, do you know that? I've heard of it, I haven't read it. Okay, well, we republished it when the Olympics thing was on, so you can get it quite easily now. And that's a collection of things to do with the Industrial Revolution okay. by Jennings. Fascinating read mm. if you ever grab hold of a copy. But in the beginning, Danny Boyle makes okay. that great quote where he talks about the diaries of Pepys Doomsday Book and the films of Mitch and Kenny. <laughs> and when I saw that, the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of those great documents of record with film documents of record, I thought, yeah, we've arrived. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Thrilled. Thank you so much. That was Very well. brilliant. Many thanks again to Tony, Jerry, Stephen and Bryony for being so informative and generous with their time. The symposium is annual, usually in April, and the festival is biannual, usually in September in the odd years. Next week will be more about the symposium and please do listen as there were really fantastic papers digging out histories that have much to tell us about the ways we operate today. If you can support the podcast on patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair, that would be hugely appreciated. Any money pledged goes towards sustaining and improving it. A huge thank you to Andrew Shiel for taking me to his world. Thanks so much for listening. Please join us for more of this next week.